So I think we are live. So good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to Youth Dialogue. Welcome to Sunny Helsinki and, and to a uh, seminar held here in our central library of Helsinki, Audi. Uh, my name is Emma Kari. Uh, I'm going to be moderating the seminar and the discussion uh, here today, and it is my great honor to welcome uh, Executive Vice President Timmermans uh, to our panel. We are so honored that you found the time to join us, travel to Helsinki and to join our discussion. We know that it's hectic in Brussels and, and in Europe at the moment, so you're warmly welcome. Thank you very much. And it's uh, my honor to moderate this event between uh, Commissioner and the representatives of the youth and, and civil society organizations. And the participants in our uh, dialogue here today. First, we start from our youngest representative, Ninni Norra, who served as the national citizen's representative of Finland in the Conference on the Future of Europe. She has experience in economic affairs through years spent in working with NGOs and experts. And next, we have Akseli Rovari, who is the Finnish Youth Climate Delegate and an active uh, student influencer and an optimist by heart. I love that this is what you <laughs> wanted to be mentioned of yourself. And next, we, are, we have Risto Rajala, who is the president of Jeff Finland, which is a youth organization focused in European affairs. He works as a parliamentary assistant in the Parliament of Finland. And then we have Emma Sairanen, who has represented young people as youth delegate for climate and was a leading force in opening the new position of youth delegate for biodiversity mm -hmm. in Finland. Currently, she is representing Finnish youth in the negotiation under the UN Convention on Biological Diversity and in the formulation of the Finnish National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan. Then. We have Jesse Jaskelainen, who works as an executive director of European Movement uh, Finland and has a background in working as an EU specialist and chairing youth organizations such as Social Democratic Student Union and European Youth Finland. And then we have Jan Sajets, who has background both as a Sami activist and a politician in Sami parliament. Now he has been working with EU Biodiversity Strategy Implementation of Finland as a representative of Sami Parliament. So you're more than welcome. Uh, the objective today is to listen and also to change uh, views. Several recent surveys have shown us that the youth wish to have their voices heard and they want to be a part in making decisions. The same also applies to the indigenous people which is also a very important aspect in our new Climate Act, uh, just approved by the Parliament. This is why I'm very happy that we have a representative of Sami here with us today. Europe, Europe has shown us that the youth in particular are concerned uh, for climate and security, and those are the topics of today. We have a very informal setup here, uh, and we will focus on short, concise questions and answers. But first, I give the floor to our guest of honor, Commissioner York. Thank you very much, and it's really a pleasure to be here. I'll be very short, concise uh, in my introduction so that we have more time uh, for discussion. Um, I've spent yesterday and today here in Helsinki and in the surroundings, and I'm really impressed by what's happening. Uh, I'm impressed by how people are committed to climate policy, to tackling the climate crisis. I'm also impressed how attached people are to their natural environment, uh, to biodiversity, and to doing the right thing. And um, uh, we're at the Commission, we stand ready to uh, be a partner. Uh, the changes we need are changes that will have to come from bottom up. They cannot be imposed from the top. What we can do from Brussels is to create the right regulatory environment so that those people working from bottom up 
to change the society into a sustainable society, get the right incentives, get the right direction, and get the right support. That is why I'm here. Uh, I, I visit all member states, and we try and tailor everything we do to the specific requirements per member state. And uh, I think in Finland we are fortunate to have such strong support. But as you know, we also have some specific challenges, uh, forestry uh, among uh, uh, other things. And uh, I'm here to discuss this openly and directly and see if we can find common ground. Thank you so much, Commissioner. That is fantastic to hear. So next we move on to the questions and the answers. You may start with your question. In yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, welcome, Vice President. Thank you for meeting us here in Finland. I'm sure my fellow panelists share the feeling of gratitude. As the citizens of representative, I would naturally like to start with the conference on the future of Europe, in which climate and environment might have been the most popular of all topics. Uh, the citizens demand a green, fair and sustainable Europe. However, citizens might also be worried that no real action is taking place, or, on the contrary, that too much climate action will hurt us now that the, uh, the war has damaged our economy. Uh, we're also facing a bit of a uh, demographic crisis with the ageing and declining population. So with all these facts in mind, uh, could you perhaps give us a few uh, key elements in European climate politics we should focus on in addition uh, to renouncing uh, Russian oil and gas? Yes, gladly. First of all, every human being has the right to be inconsistent. Uh, but if you're in politics, uh, your politics need to be consistent. Um, so what I'm offering is a pathway to speeding up our transition to a sustainable society. And both COVID and this horrible war are incentives to go faster, not slower. Um, very concretely, we need to learn to use less energy. It's possible. We can save a lot more energy than what we're doing now. Um, and I won't go into detail because I need to, but we can discuss this further. So we need to save more energy and it is entirely possible. Second, we need to speed up our transition to renewable energy. And also this is possible. Technology is going through a very exciting phase of innovation that we need to apply. We need to have solar panels on all the roofs in all of Europe. Um, and sometimes people say, well, but we're in the north, it's less uh, efficient. Helsinki has just as many sun hours as Amsterdam, so that's not the issue. The issue is they're not always at the same time. Um, so it's an issue of where you store the energy and how you distribute the energy, but the energy is there, and it would be, it would be wrong not to use that huge potential also in, in, in Finland. Also, we need to increase double the amount of uh, biomethane we produce as an alternative, and we need to do much, much more speedy permitting not uh, lowering the requirements, but making the permitting much more speedy. So you create go-to areas where you do the permitting for a whole area and you don't have to do the permitting per project. And you make sure that the whole area is safe from an environmental point of view, then projects can come in much more quickly. Now, very often it's about seven or eight years before a project is realized, we can, we can reduce the permitting uh, procedure from seven to one year if we do it uh, in a smart way. Uh, so these are some of the uh, measures uh, we uh, can take, but only if we understand that the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis are intimately linked. So every measure we take to face the climate crisis should be benchmarked against also taking the right decisions on the biodiversity crisis. And that sometimes is difficult for people to understand. People understand the urgency of the climate crisis, but I will need all you guys in support to also transmit the sense of urgency on the eco side that is happening, because it's really an eco side that we are facing. And we need the same public awareness and the same public sense of urgency there as well. Exactly. Thank you so much. Next, Axel. Yes, um, you had some good points regarding energy uh, in your last uh, statement. And I'd like to dive deeper into energy and specifically um, nuclear power. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'd like to ask that um, it's, I think it's become much clear that nuclear energy should and could have a very important role during this uh, transition to uh, green energy and at the same time uh, within the energy crisis we are facing with the situation of Russia having a horrible attack uh, against Ukraine. Um, but at the same time there's been some very, uh, in my, my opinion, very um, alarming developments regarding nuclear energy, shutting down uh, power plants in the uh, middle European countries. So I'd like to ask why isn't carbon neutral nuclear energy to see more of a bigger uh, solution in the EU. And what is the EU going to do about this? Well, I think, you know, as I said before, member states cannot be compared one to the other in all aspects. And the choice for nuclear is really a national choice. And some member states have an unconditional choice for nuclear, like France. Other member states have an unconditional no, uh, choice against nuclear, like Germany, Austria, Luxembourg. Um, and we at the Commission want to leave that choice up to uh, uh, the member state. Uh, some uh, countries are heavily invested in nuclear and they will modernize it and, and, and continue to use it. Our task is then to support them there, to give them the right security guarantees. That's, that's our, our treaty-based uh, obligation and we will continue to do that. Now, what I would like to, what I argue also in my own country when this discussion comes up, um, do me a favor and make it a rational choice. Just put everything, the advantages and the disadvantages next to each other, the cost uh, 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 and the alternatives next to each other, and then the bottom line should dictate whether it's a good choice for you or not. Um, the advantage of nuclear is that it can provide what we call a base load in your energy, uh, constant base load in your energy supply. That's a huge advantage. The disadvantage of nuclear, it takes a tremendous amount of time before you have a functioning nuclear power plant. Uh, yours in here in Finland, how many years too late? 13 years after, or something like that, after, <laughs> after planned? Well, don't laugh, it's, it's everywhere. It's not a Finnish problem, it's, it's a, a global problem. It takes much, much longer than planned and they're always gigantically over budget. Um, and, and so you have to count for that. When are we going to get this electricity out of that plant? And do I have the time to wait for that? Or should I look for alternatives such as offshore wind and solar, who have the disadvantage of being more difficult in terms of base, base load, but who are frankly much, much cheaper now and much, much quicker to install and start. So it's, it's that, it's that um, choice you have to make. And the choice will not be the same in uh, every member state. And sometimes the choice is rational, as I say. Sometimes it's also ideological or economic because you hope to be able to export your nuclear uh, power to others. Um, but that's, that's a sovereign right of member states and they do it under the control of their citizens. And if their citizens approve of it, they can do that as long as they know what they're doing. That's my, biggest, that's my only, uh, only question. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Risto. I would like to ask you about uh, promoting the circular economy. Um, we use natural resources uh, far too extensively, uh, which weakens the state of our environment and creates emissions. It is absolutely crucial for us uh, to uh, create an economy where products that are manufactured from scarce resources uh, stay in their original form of use as long as possible, and after this, uh, all the materials are used, used elsewhere maximally. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see that the EU could boost circularity uh, in our current economic system? Well, um, we've, we're already, you know we've already presented a package of, of circular economy uh, measures and we're now preparing the second one. And, and for us this is of extreme importance because we, will have to, we have to become much, much resource efficient and more efficient than we are today. Now, how can, you, how can you do that? Several things we can do. First of all, consumers who are well-informed are better uh, in, uh, have more power to make the right decisions. So we need to make sure that we inform consumers about the durability and repairability and recyclability of, of products. Uh, secondly, we need to also do a bit of, of dialogue and education on um, changing our own consumption patterns. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, the iPhone I have, uh, do I have it with me? Yes. Um, if, if the battery no longer works, it takes an incredible uh, amount of trouble to replace it. Whereas the old Nokias we had, you just pulled out the battery and put in a new one. 
Um, why can't we do that? Why can't we? I think we can legislate so that this is much more easier. We can also legislate that the, should, the quality should be better and that it should be repairable. We can also legislate that certain amount of the content should be recyclable. Just put it into legislation, then the industry knows what they need to do. Uh, we had a tremendous success uh, with our eco-design uh, legislation, which led to um, uh, billions of euros being uh, not spent on energy because they, uh, the appliances needed to be much more energy efficient. Uh, we also need to, to introduce um, these um, uh, labels that people are used to now with all the colors for, for uh, uh, washing machines, etc. Now you know which is more energy efficient. We need to use, uh, introduce that for all consumption products, especially textiles. Textiles is one of the biggest challenges we will have. We are only recycling 10% of our textile. 10%, 90% is burnt or ends up in landfill. If we can change that logic and make it more recyclable and also create labels in the textile industry that no longer fool the consumers or, or, or make things look nicer than they really are and that we can check those labels, that there is no child labor involved, that the uh, fibers can be recycled and, or are already recycled, etc., etc. But it all starts with an understanding of the hierarchy of production. So you have a product, if it reaches, it should have a longer uh, uh, lifespan, if it breaks, it should be repairable. If it's no longer repairable, it should be recyclable. If it's no longer recyclable, it should be reconstructed completely and used as a primary material again. That's how you create a loop, an eternal loop, and then you need much less energy and much less uh, primary resources that very often we don't even have. Uh, so I think that would be a contribution to the circular economy. And I would, I would also urge young people to rethink how we see textiles, and I see it happening. You know, things like Vinted, um, you know, for my parents, I'm, I'm from a working class background. For my parents, the very idea of wearing secondhand clothes was unthinkable because it would be an admission of poverty. Um, now I see my kids exchanging clothes with their friends, going on Vinted and other uh, sites to sell their clothes and buy other clothes is becoming very popular, and we need to incorporate that sort of behavior into the textiles industry. We also need to convince the big fashion houses that they should change their ways because big fashion changes collections very rapidly and every time it's new fabric, every time. And also it should be made cool for them to do things differently. So that's how I believe we can really, really bring about a circular economy. Exactly, thank you so much. Next we have Emma. Thank you. Globally, we're trying to aim at getting to a world where we could live in harmony with nature. I, when I've been talking with my colleagues from other parts of the world, I think young people are really calling up for us to create policies that would be less human-centric and more eco-centric. Yes. So I'm wondering what kind of steps could we take in Europe to prioritize other living beings besides humans? Could we, for example, you already brought up ecocide, so the criminalization of large-scale environmental destruction, but then we have also concepts like nature's rights. Could these be implemented in Europe? I think, I think we, need, we need a lot of work on that. I think we're going to end up with nature having rights that are also, also uh, upheld before courts. We're not there yet, uh, but this is something... Uh, do you know a, a, a lawyer called Philippe Sands? He, you should check him out. He's a, a British uh, a lawyer who's done enormous work on human rights issues, but who's now thinking on nature's rights issues and how that concept... You know, the, the concept of, of uh, crime against humanity is very new. It was invented after the atrocities of the Nazis after the Second World War. We think it's been there forever, but uh, a genocide, crime against humanity, has only, you know, it was born in Nuremberg. Um, and, and so Philip Sand's reasoning is, if, the, if we could create that as a system that is now accepted globally in relatively short period of time, we should also start thinking about the rights of our natural environment in the same way. We're not, not there yet by a long stretch, but I just want to, to put it out there. This is something we need to think about. At the same time, I think there's a, a philosophical thing that we need to, and I need your generation in that. We need to, from our, from our 
let me put it in a very personal way. Our Christian, my Christian heritage has always distinguished us from the animal kingdom. Set us aside from the animal kingdom, and the animal kingdom was at the service of humanity. Now, we need to understand, as human beings, that we are in the animal kingdom. It is not our, our tool to use. We are part of it. And if we kill pollinators, we're killing ourselves. If we, if we, if we don't stop ecocide, it's going to kill us. Uh, so the, the, the understanding that we're not just protecting all oh, those cute little animals. No, we're fighting for our own survival. And we need a vibrant natural environment for our own survival. If we can get that concept into people's minds, we have a different debate about the rights of our, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that the natural environment was put there at our disposal to, to like, like, you know, like a throwaway economy. You use it and you throw it away because that's our God-given right. We should, we should understand that you could also interpret, in my case, Christianity in saying God gave us uh, uh, the obligation to take care of our natural environment as custodians of the natural environment. So it's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not disputing religion. I'm only saying we should rethink our place in natural environment. We're part of this. We're part of this. And the planet doesn't care. If we screw up, the planet will continue to exist without us. It has existed without us for so long. It could do that again. If we screw up, we're only killing ourselves. And, and, and that is, I think, a concept that needs to be promoted in our educational system, that young people need to, if they agree with me at least, <laughs> need to also promote in, in their way. They talk about society. Our society depends on the stopping of ecocide. Ecocide will ultimately lead to genocide if, we, if, we're, not, if we're not careful. I must show you my shirt that I have on today because I'm exactly <laughs> trying to the same message that you brought up. Very nice. <laughs> That's very a very nice. important message you have there. <laughs> just thought that Commissioner just said that when we're fighting for biodiversity, we're actually fighting for ourselves is something that is very important and I hope everyone here takes that thought with you when you leave. Uh, next, we have yes. Thank you. So energy politics is not only a part of domestic politics, mm -hmm. it's also, it also has a huge spillover effects on, on foreign policy. Yeah. So my question also considers uh, the security of energy supply chains. Mm -hmm. Should the EU have its own security of supp supply chains in, in energy? You know, the only way we can create sort of energy sovereignty in Europe is through renewable energy because we have no oil, very little gas, very little coal and it's, it's getting almost impossible to get at that coal. Uh, so we should not be thinking in terms, fossil fuels will not create sovereignty, will not create our own self-sufficiency. Renewable can do that this to some extent, to most of what we need. So solar, wind, geothermal, uh, biomass, uh, biomethane, these are the sources that will create more uh, energy sovereignty in Europe. At the same time, we will need more energy than we can make ourselves. So I believe the basis of that future energy will be hydrogen. And what we need to do is to create a global system of interdependency on hydrogen. Never again on only a few countries, because hydrogen Everywhere where they, where they have a lot of sun and a lot of wind, they can create more electricity than they need, and the excess electricity can be stored in hydrogen or in ammonia, and that can be the energy source. You can make steel of it, you can make cement from it, you can, you can, you can uh, create the basis for, for uh, um, airplane fuels, you can uh, have ships run on ammonia, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, but to do that, we need to create a global network. Uh, partly it will be based on the already existing network for petro petrochemicals because you need pipelines, etc., and you can refurbish those pipelines relatively easily. But partly we will also give huge opportunities to uh, the developing world. In Africa, you have so much sun. They can, if you help Africa build up solar power, they can bring electricity to every remote village in Africa. And on top of that, they can create so much electricity store it in hydrogen and ammonia and export it uh, uh, to Europe. Um, um, all the countries now still uh, involved in hydrocarbons who are thinking about the future 
after hydrocarbons are thinking about hydrogen. And we need to be part of that uh, development. Then Europe can combine, one, its own energy production through renewables, two, an interdependency with larger parts of the world so that if we have a conflict with one country, they cannot blackmail us with the hydrogen uh, they produce because we can then get it somewhere else. I think that is that creates more stability and it creates a, a more equal balance in the international energy markets of the future. Exactly. Thank you. And last question we have from Jan. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. I'm really impressed by your wise, wise words. And uh, my question is related to biodiversity that is considered by Sami as one of the crucial aspects to survival, as you said, for people, biodiversity is a basic uh, to survive. And uh, all are related to land use issues, like the climate change too, from the Sami perspective. And um, <clears throat> uh, in the Sami home region, there are a lot of unprotected uh, old growth forests and primal forests that are still uh, used for economical use and that is against the EU biodiversity strategy. And uh, uh, for instance, last winter over 400 year old forest regions were clear cut in my home region where I come from, from my reindeer herding unit. Uh, how could EU bring the goodwill of the Commission and what you are saying and the politics EU is doing to put forward or try to avoid the loopholes that forestry and uh, the pro-forestry people are talking or trying to go around the EU strategy need to pr protect forests. How can EU guarantee that forests are protected? Well, you know, what, what I what I have learned over the last years um, in Finland and Sweden, but also worldwide, is that the most vulnerable people in this climate crisis and biodiversity crisis are what we generally, on a global level, refer to as indig indigenous people, people who depend for their survival on a healthy natural environment. Uh, and this uh, applies to Sami just as much as it applies to people in Central uh, Africa or in Latin America or in Asia. So this is a global, global, global challenge. Now, what makes the challenge more complicated is that many of these indigenous peoples who have been, um, uh, who have not been able to take part in the economic and social growth very often of their society at large, I'm not saying it's the case of Sami, but in general, they are then co-opted into an economic system that actually destroys the natural uh, environment. And that puts them in an incredibly complicated situation. And I, 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 I noticed that in Africa, I noticed that in the Amazonas, I noticed that in Asia. So you, you have, people then become very insecure. What should I do? If I go for nature protection, I will lose my income. But if I continue having this income, my children or grandchildren will no longer have uh, the natural environment that we deem essential for our culture and uh, for our people. So the only way to come out of this is to recognize that we can only solve this if we respect a triangle, economy, ecology, social justice. And you have to go to every rural area and say, the economy cannot be promoted at the expense of the ecology because that would undermine the long-term economy and the social position of rural populations should be the focus, focal point of our um, uh, uh, policy. Very often the people making money in this economy are city dwellers, not the people living in the region. So you need to, on a national level and international level, we need to find ways of redistributing what is gained in, um, in, uh, as long as it's done in a sustainable way from people who are now gaining from that to make sure it's redistributed through tax systems or other systems to uh, the uh, indigenous people who live in that region. There is no other way. We have to make sure that they are supported and that they are rewarded 
not for being part of the economy that destroys the natural environment, but for being part of a social and economic system that strengthens the natural environment. Why are we not paying people to safeguard our natural environment? Why are we not stimulating them to do the right thing? You know, the, the, the money they make in this economy uh, whether it's felling or whether it's, it's, it's exploitative ag uh, agriculture um, is very limited. They are not the ones making a lot of money. A lot of money is made elsewhere. So that limited money, if you would sort of transpose that into a subsidy or a payment for other activities, it would not be that expensive to uh, the central government or even to the European Union. If we could reform our common agricultural policy more so that it not only rewards production, but it rewards being custodian of the natural environment. It rewards taking care of protected uh, areas. That's what we need to do, because just saying we will protect nature without having in mind that for that you need to have a credible social project for the people living in those areas, then the ones who win are the big capitalists who are making a lot of money out of, out of the natural uh, resources. So it has to be a systemic approach. Uh, starting from the idea that if they have an income there, which is not sustainable, they have to be able to reach an income there, but from another source to, that will reward them for protecting our natural environment. And why? It's not just because to give them an income. No, it's also because society at large should be grateful to those people who maintain our natural environment and help us survive, even if we don't live there ourselves. I have to thank you for this answer. This is right at the heart of our national uh, discussion as well. And, and I love this way of thinking that we as a society should be thankful for those, also for those landowners or, or, or people working in our agriculture who are actually uh, working every day for biodiversity and, and stopping climate change. And of course, I also want to thank John for putting this important issue on the table. Our panelists have been very good and strict. I told them that I'm going to be a strict moderator and they have to stick to their time limits. And I'm glad to say that we have time for one very short question from the audience. If there is someone who would want to raise a topic, go ahead. The floor is yours. Do we have a mic or? Uh, you just have to be very loud and I can repeat the question if you want. Thank you so much. So everyone listening us from uh, via the stream, uh, there was a representative from the student union asking the commissioner that how can we make sure that the voice of the youth is being heard when making decisions affecting their future on an EU level? Well, first of all, I think it would be a good start if we everywhere lower the voting age to 16. Uh, it's high time that is done everywhere. Um, secondly, my appeal to, to your generation, you are the best educated, healthiest, strongest, best connected generation in European history. Never forget that. But you're also the generation that has been confronted with the most crises since living memory, starting in 2008, one crisis after the other, and, and COVID isn't even, even finished, and the war starts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I, think, I think we, uh, we should be uh, incredibly um, grateful to your generation for having been having shown such solidarity in the COVID crisis with my generation and I think it's about time my generation started paying back that solidarity now with the climate crisis we're not doing that enough so if we're not doing that enough you should force us and you can force us if you get organized uh, and you need to get organized and even if you don't like the existing institutions you need to conquer these existing institutions and then mold them into what you would like them to be, whether it's political parties, whether it's, it's media, whatever. You have to be heard and seen before you are listened to. Uh, you know, uh, I have kids, uh, you know, ranging from 35 to 16, and they all have very strong opinions, 
But too often they believe putting the opinion on Facebook is enough. Then it's out there and people will follow it. No, it's a sad reality that you need to get organized. And the only way in a open society, democracy, to get organized and have influence is to create mass, to create a movement. We would not have a Green Deal without Fridays for Future. Exactly. Fridays for Future made an impression because they went into the streets. Not because they went on Facebook or TikTok or whatever. No, they went into the streets. And that's so, so that's the second point. My third point is, is a challenge to you. One of my biggest worries today in our society is that under the influence of internet and social media, we have become accustomed to only talking to and listen to people whom, with whom we agree. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, we feel uncomfortable to be confronted with opinions we don't agree with. And in an open society and a liberal democracy, that's the end, the death of democracy. We need to restore the art of disagreeing well. We need to restore the, the discipline to listen to people and engage with people with whom you don't agree. You are, I, I described your generation, and I also know exactly your extended bubble, if I can call it like that, but there's also many, many young people, your generation, who are completely disconnected from all of this, who, who are disillusioned who don't see a place for themselves in society, who are angry, who revert to drugs or violence because they don't feel that they are listened to or p are being even part of this society. Reach out to them and if, you know, perhaps they will, they will slap away your hand, but you will have extended your hand and at some point they will grab the hand. And I, 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 I feel that in, in, if we don't want the autocrats like Putin to win, we will have to rediscover the noble art of disagreeing well and then finding a compromise that leaves no one behind. And because in this crisis, in this combined climate and ecological crisis, many people explicitly, but also very often emotionally, feel that they're going to be left behind. And this cannot happen. This transition will be just, or the just will be no transition. If people feel that they're being left behind, they will just stop everything, even if they know that this will end in catastrophe. If nobody listens to them, if they don't feel part of that, they will just stop everything. So that's my final appeal to you. Please make an effort to engage with everyone in your generation and then also with other generations. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an excellent point and an excellent answer. This is also one of the ideas that we are having these very important discussions on these important topics in the libraries. Also, the, the ministers in, in, in the Finnish government have been going in libraries and talking with people. And that is one of those reasons why it's so important that we're having this discussion here. Can I, can I, would you allow me to say something about that? Of course. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a great fan of literature. And I know this day and age, when we talk about science, we always talk about, you know, hard science, uh, technology. Uh, if you want economics, which is not a hard science, but anyway. Uh, um, uh, chemistry, uh, biology, uh, all these things that we need for innovation. But to keep a society going, you also need to develop the capacity to look at the world through the eyes of another person, to be able to understand somebody else. For that, we need the humanities. We need to understand that we cannot live without culture. We need to understand that we need to read literature, that we need to go to the theater, that we need to go and see ballet. That is what confronts us with what it, what it is to be human, what humanity is. If we forget what humanity is and reduce it to our own persona, to nothing but myself within the contours of my body and my being, we destroy society. The only way we can, in an open democratic society, we have to have the capacity to look at the world through the eyes of another. And nothing but art, literature, helps us do that. That's what, that's what an artist does. They recreate the world through their eyes and invite you to look at it. And this is the only way we can make society function in a world that is changing so rapidly. Yes, we need science and technology, but we also need the humanities. Exactly. And I'm also, also very happy to tell all the people listening to this discussion via internet that we are having this discussion also right next to the children's uh, sector in the library, which is also a very important part when raising the uh, future decision makers of the world.
I think we could continue this discussion about the meaning of the culture and art in, in the, the whole sis democratic system and of course also in the environmental uh, uh, decision making, but we still have time for a few more questions from our uh, representatives of youth and, and different uh, organizations. I think this time we can start with Jan. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> From Sami perspective, uh, the land use issues are crucial and uh, uh, climate change and the different kind of ecological uh, problems induce companies searching for green uh, solutions for their customers like green energy and that has caused a, quite the boom of green colonialism in the Sami home regions, both in Sweden and in Finland, and also in Norway, which is of course not EU. But uh, <clears throat> how could EU help Sami people uh, to have more ethical company politics or uh, uh, company uh, procedures there that they would not uh, use the lands too harmfully. Well, I, I would, I would, I would say in in the Finnish context, I would say to anybody involved, whether it's the industry, whether it's the forest owners, whether it's the Sami population, whether it's politicians, whether it's journalists, listen to the wisdom of the climate panel. Uh, they are making very thorough analyses. Uh, there's not somebody from Brussels who's going to come and tell you how the situation is and what best to do. You have, uh, in terms of forestry, you have among the best scientists in the world. And some of them are represented on that climate panel. And they are trying not just to make an analysis of the situation and, and, and what is happening and what is not going well and what is going well. They also come with solutions. Uh, and I think they should, be, they should be heard. It's then, of course, up to the politicians to take decisions whether they want it or not. But if they want it, the answer is there for them uh, to pick up. Thank you. And we have just in the new Climate Act that was adopted by the, the Parliament uh, decided to start a new Sami Climate Council. That is people that have the traditional knowledge of the North, of the Sami way of life, and then of, of course also researchers. So that is a very important step on this area, mm -hmm. area as well. Next we have yes. Okay, so uh, my second question considers technology, and I think here is also an uh, uh, important security aspect as mm -hmm. well. So, uh, like you said, many of us uh, own a phone, <laughs> or we use social media, uh, so hardware and software, that's designed somewhere else than Europe. They're designed in the United States, they're designed in China, Japan, uh, these uh, major uh, technology uh, countries. Uh, my question is that should the EU have its own champions and should we uh, enhance our actions in technology and in social media so that we would have this, our own Silicon Valleys or, or technology centers we would, where we would uh, produce European phones, yeah. European social medias that yes. have European DNA? Mm -hmm. Well, let me let me take you back a bit. Um, you know, the, the advantage I have is I'm old. Uh, you know, I was born right after we invented the wheel. So, uh, <laughs> long before. so um, I remember very, I remember Hillary Clinton saying to me, "Wow, you can use one phone here and over there. I have to use different phones." You know, when when Europe came with the uh, GSM, and we had the best phones in the world, many of them Finnish. <laughs> um, uh, other Swedish, uh, almost unbreakable, uh, functioning always, easily to repair, etc. All of that, and then at some point, um, Europeans thought, and we had the best network, uh, we had the best functioning, everything, and then Europeans thought, um, the internet, yeah, but we don't need that on a phone. That's never going to happen. That's never going to happen. Uh, smartphones will never be a thing. It was a conscious decision not mm -hmm. to explore that. And that's when technology changes so quickly, you sometimes make epic mistakes, um, which is what Europe did at the time. Uh, so that's why this whole thing became based in the US and then 
uh, also in Asia, it was picked up, uh, and that's why we were sort of trying to catch up all the time. But then if I look at technologies where we lead, and even lead today, we spoke earlier about hydrogen. We are the best in the world on that, and we lead, but we, if we, we need to invest collectively in the further development of that technology, and we will continue to lead. But if we take too long, then others will copy us and then overtake us. We've had that in the past. So you are absolutely right. We need to identify areas where we lead and we should extend that leadership and then monetize that globally. Um, and I think hydrogen is one of them. I think in AI, we're not that bad. We're doing quite, quite world-leading stuff. I think that in uh, biotech, uh, nobody can beat us, and we need to, to continue to, to develop that. Um, but we need to understand that given the, the scale of the investment, look at, look at semiconductors. Uh, the best semiconductor machine producer is a Dutch firm, better than anybody in, else in the world. But to go from there to actually have your own semiconductors, you don't need 100, 200, 300, 400 million in terms of investment. You need five, six, seven, eight, nine billion. And for that, you need the scale of the whole of Europe. It can no longer be done by individual member states. So we need to understand, we need to upscale at the European scale if we want to be leading in, uh, in uh, technology. And I've given you a couple of examples. There are more. In automotive, we were so, I don't want to use a negative word, but let me say we were so um, uh, happy with ourselves, not to use a stronger term, that we missed the initial revolution to electric mobility. And the whole battery production is now in Asia. But we're catching up. We, because we created a European battery alliance, we are now going to make better batteries, recyclable batteries, solid state batteries that are lighter and have more uh, capacity. And we are finally quickly reforming the car industry. We will be leading again in the car industry, but we, we missed a couple of years out of frankly arrogance. Uh, so now, uh, you know, never underestimate the innovative capacity of Europe. The one thing we, you know, we, we shouldn't be like the Americans always overstating our case. But we should not be too European in always understating our case. We should be proud of what we can do. We can do so much together as Europeans. Only if outsiders or us ourselves uh, 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 divide us, then we will fail. But if we are united... This crisis, also this war, shows it. If we are united, nobody can topple us. Exactly what an important point about the importance of being united. Next we have Emma. The floor is yours. Thank you. The European Environment Agency has very clearly highlighted that at the moment we don't have evidence that economic growth could be decoupled from the negative environmental impacts and we were also earlier talking about how indigenous peoples are being pulled into our current economic systems that then pushes them to destroy their natural environments and uh, we also talked about empathy about how we should be able to relate to other people and I believe our economic system is also there pushing us further apart and pushing us to think about ourselves so what kind of options do we have on the EU and are we considering other kind of models or ways of thinking alongside or even to replace our current green growth narratives? Well, we, we have been able to decouple emissions from economic growth. Yes, mm -hmm. but then the that's resource emissions. extraction. Yeah, but that's just emissions. No. But the same logic should apply in the rest of the economy and that starts with the circular economy. If we can decouple uh, growth from emissions, we should also be able to decouple growth from excessive use of natural resources, decouple growth from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, social degradation, which is one of the bigger uh, problems, decouple growth from uh, hurting our natural environment. Because um, what we need to do for that, very concretely, is to be able to calculate all the externalities in our economy so that we don't only factor in capital and labor in our economy, but also environment. Uh, natural uh, degradation, the state of uh, uh, our ecology, etc. If you can, it's, it's not that difficult to put that in economic models, to, to, to price factor it in. And if we do that and shape our economic model to include that price and to make sure that whatever we do, it does respect uh, uh, the nat natural environment and does protect the natural environment, I think we will be winners. It will be costly at the beginning, but it's, it's the model that we will need to 
um, follow because I notice that this is not just something that's happening in Europe, um, all across the world, also in China, in Africa, all across Asia, uh, the understanding is that if they continue like that, they will create massive problems for themselves because of the uh, nature degradation and other issues. So factoring that in, in economic growth, is increasingly going to be part of the global economy. And if we do that first, and we develop models that reflect that, and that uh, uh, help us to adapt and to change uh, the way we produce uh, uh, and consume, also consume, then I think we can be a model for the rest uh, of the world. It's going to be difficult. But like with the climate crisis, once people see it, they will act. Uh, people don't see it yet. And what we're asking of people is to change their behavior. But we're not asking of people to go live in a cave and munch on grass. We're just asking relatively modest changes in behavior. Consider eating less meat. It has an enormous impact on our natural environment. Uh, consider letting the car sit and, and use your bike a bit more or public transport a bit more. Consider making uh, clear choices uh, when you buy things. Uh, is it, are they repairable, recyclable, etc.? Being slightly more considerate as a population will help us uh, go into the right direction. And it's also going to be an economic positive element because the world economy sooner or later is going to develop in that direction. I hope sooner because if it's later, the costs are going to be much higher. Uh, and that's also something that we need to educate ourselves in to understand that the early innovators pay a lower price than those who will come later. I think this important note of about the commissioner made here that it's not doesn't need a revolution. It needs us to be a slightly more considerate. It's a very important point. Next, we have Rist. The floor is Thank you. Uh, I, as an outspoken federalist, uh, wish to see a European Union that effectively uh, fights the climate crisis and shapes the world around us with bold policies. Uh, I believe that in order to achieve this, uh, we. Uh, in order to achieve this fully, uh, the EU must be strengthened. Uh, what is your opinion on institutional reforms? Uh, do you see that there's a need for, for example, treaty changes, or uh, are there other ways to make the EU more effective that you prefer? Oh, what a good question. <laughs> uh, what an incredible question. No, because uh, I'm not, I, w I was thinking, should I, should I just open up on this, or should I give you the institutionally uh, adequate answer. Please open up. Yeah. <laughs> well, once I said that, I know you would say that, and so I have to. You know, I was a member of the European Convention. I, and that was before enlargement. And if I remember how difficult it was to change a bit in the treaty, and then it was also defeated in my country and in France in a referendum because it was relatively easy to build up a whole mythology about what it was or what it wasn't. Then, given the urgency of what we need to do, I'm not sure I would like us to spend, again, two or three years debating uh, uh, how the EU should be, should be structured, which means that energy that we should put into facing Russia, into uh, 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 putting efforts into our climate policy, into facing uh, ecocide, into facing the enormous, enormous threats to stability and security in Africa, just to name a couple of issues. Would we not be distracted then? And then, and then end up in another debate between member states and between populations, oh my God, am I selling myself out to Europe? Who's going to dominate and all that? So I'm a bit reluctant to go down that road, although for, uh, as, a, as a lawyer, as an EU lawyer, I would say there's all sorts of reasons why we would need treaty change. But as a politician and as somebody who has an incredible sense of urgency given the task we are facing today, I would say try and do things without uh, endeavoring on, on treaty change for now. And, you know, the COVID and Russia have shown us that if we have, if we are challenged, we can act together. We can act together. I think we have been brought closer together than ever before, not because of treaty change, but because of external threats to, to, to our well-being and survival. And I think today, you know, 
one thing that the one thing that made us uh, hesitant over many years what, what is what in in political theory is referred to as um, moral hazard. What is moral hazard? You don't trust each other, uh, and and you knew it. And you're like the Dutch. You uh, had uh, great misgivings about giving giving money to Southern Europeans who retire at 50 and spend their time on the beach. There was a a complete caricature. That's not the reality. People in the south of Europe work very more longer hours than people in Finland or the Netherlands. But the impression was completely different. It's, it was not a, a matter of application and hard work. It was a matter of productivity. That's the difference. Uh, and, and, so, and people in the south were saying, yes, these people in the north, they've imposed their currency on us, and now they're pos imposing their economic model, which is strangling us on us. Also, a complete caricature. And COVID has helped us overcome that. And today I see much, much less feelings of moral hazard between European states. And if we continue this strong solidarity on Russia, and let's be fair, not everybody has the same understanding of Russia as Finland has. Uh, but for now, also those member states further away from Russia who have less understanding, and some are even quite Russophile, uh, uh, at the beginning, they've all shown, if, with one exception, full solidarity in this crisis. And I think that is something we need to build on. And perhaps that could then lead member states and institutions to be more relaxed about more cohesion and more things we do uh, together. Because they understand, you know, if, if we can now finally get a European refugee policy, uh, for instance, which was refused until now, because we see that at the end of the day, we're all in the same boat. That could help Europe go forward. But, but my honest answer to your question, should we have treaty change? It would be a good idea if we had all the time in the world and if we were not confronted with immediate crises. Now that we are confronted with immediate crises, we need to look for alternative ways to create more synergy in Europe and more togetherness in Europe. Thank you. And next, Axel. Yes, thank you for some um, very important uh, themes brought up today. Um, I'd like to ask you a very topical question. Uh, in the last days, we've read news from the European Parliament regarding the emission trading system revision and uh, what's happened there with it collapsing, at least partially. So I'd like to gain your insight on this matter. What is the future and what's going to happen and what, what should happen regarding the emission trading system? Well, I believe that, uh, of course, what we propose, Fit for 55, is a holistic approach to the whole issue. Every measure is linked to the other measure. It's, it, because it is a transformation of society as a whole, all the measures are interlinked. Um, and therefore, the complexity of all of this is enormous, enormous. And what happened in the European Parliament uh, earlier this week is that, at some point, um, a difference of opinion on a small part of uh, the package on one issue led to one party, mm, how should I say this, one party being disappointed in another party and retaliating. And so you had an escalation of, 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 of reactions which led to the whole thing not materializing in a vote. Um, now. I believe there is such an opportunity to reach consensus here, and they were so close to consensus that if they put their minds to it in these days, the next couple of days, next week, they will be very close again to finding an agreement. And perhaps then later this month, when there is another plenary in Brussels, they could hopefully vote again and then uh, vote uh, the package. So, so I hope that will, will happen. Nobody. Everybody understands the importance of the emissions trading system. By the way, the Chinese are copying it, so we're doing something right. Um, <laughs> and, and so nobody wants to bring down the uh, ETS. Nobody wants to do that. But they don't agree on how far the reforms uh, should go, so they need to find a compromise. And I, I think we're very close to that, I hope. It's also a bit of a wish, of course. Uh, and then hopefully later this month there will be a, a, a vote, and hopefully a positive vote. Um, and I'm very happy with the clarity that the European Parliament gave in support of uh, the Commission's proposal to uh, terminate the uh, building of uh, combustion engine cars and vehicles by 2035. 
Thank you, and thank you for giving us this optimistic uh, view on what's going to happen during the last uh, next few weeks. I think we all needed that after the news we got from the parliament earlier this week. And last we have Nindi. The floor yes. is yours. Um, before my question, I would just like to thank you for your excellent commentary on the treaty changes, because as a pro-European who doesn't see the point in the treaty change, it can sometimes be very difficult to explain the position, but I do share the opinion that if we could bring bring ourselves to hold a constitutional convention now with all the resources while people are still dying on Ukrainian soil it would just feel incredibly selfish and bizarre so thank you for exploring that but now for my question investment protection agreements particularly the uh, energy charter treaty shortly known as the ECT seems to go completely against uh, both climate goals but also free and fair competition and likewise energy companies are struggling with rapidly changing legislation and sustainability criteria which often leave no room for long-term planning required for successful trade. So how could we ensure that the corporate world isn't protected by these artificial and unjust measures while creating a lucrative business environment for, for green and sustainable companies, especially in the energy sectors which is desperately need alternatives? Ha, again, an incredibly good question, a very complicated, because what you are addressing is actually changing an economic model that has been in existence for 200 years. You know, the whole society we've built, everything, lock, stock and barrel, is built on fossil fuels. Everything. Everything we have, everything we've developed, the social system, the educational system, healthcare systems, it's all financed by an economy that is based on fossil fuels and is based on abundance, uh, excessive abundance. And we need to change two things, get rid of fossil fuels and change the mindset so that we understand that we can have an economy that grows without excessive abundance, uh, which is another fundamental change uh, after 200 years. But now back to the energy uh, sector. I, for one, uh, have been disgusted in the last months if you compare on the one side uh, the level of energy prices many Europeans, you're, you're a bit more fortunate because of your energy mix here, but many Europeans are faced with exploding uh, energy bills uh, right now. It's also the consequence of, of a combination, but the consequence of the war as well. And at the same time, energy companies, oil companies, are making record profits, but never seen before, profits. It's, it's three, four times in a year what they would normally uh, make as profits in a year. And that is not corrected. Um, and they are just hurting themselves and their own reputation if they don't understand that this is perceived as deeply unjust in the whole of society. Now, if we could say to them, okay, you made these incredible profits, it would be nice if you could give back something uh, to uh, the people. But you can do that in two ways, just by being taxed, that's a possibility, or by committing to investing that in renewable energy. You know, the oil companies have doubled their investments in renewable energy. And as part of their investment portfolio, I think on average they went from 2% to 4%. Wow. So still, Billions and billions of dollars and euros are invested in fossil fuels. That's where the system goes wrong. And, and we need to use all the, of course, we're a free market economy. They make their own choices. But we need to incentivize them to move away from, and we're still subsidizing fossil fuel. We need to move away from that and show to them that their future is sustainable as well and that they have to rethink their economy. Some are doing that, but, but not boldly enough. And the answer is always the same. Yes, the shareholders don't want it. Um, yes, you have shareholders, but humanity, the entire humanity are also your stakeholders. And if, if we don't change that mindset, then we will continue to have a problem there. And the problem you have signaled of accountability, which is a consequence of the special status of the energy sector, needs to be addressed as well. You know that we're already doing that. In, in trade agreements. We no longer accept the traditional uh, uh, dispute settlement systems uh, that were outside of normal uh, legal structures. We have already changed that and we need to change that as well. 
Thank you so much, Commissioner. And it, I'm sad to tell you all that our time is already out that we had for this panel, but I want to thank the representatives of the youth organizations and the civil society for your important question. I want to thank our audience uh, for being here, for being part of the discussion, and of course, all the people uh, attending this discussion online. I have to say that during my time as the Minister of Environment and Climate, I had the privilege of following your work very closely and I got to know you as a true champion for climate, for the biodiversity and for the planet. And I want to thank you for the work you're doing from the bottom of my heart. For, Of course, not, because I have, not just because I have three children and the work that you're doing with biodiversity and, and climate change is so important at the moment. And, it's and more I, important I, than ever. And I want to thank you the Finnish people, the Finnish government, for being such staunch supporters for climate policy, for biodiversity policy. Finland is a leader in this, and I need your leadership. And this leadership is borne by uh, the people, uh, because you want it. And, and, and you should keep your politicians on their toes, so that they continue to do that. But Finland in the EU is one of my strongest supporters, one of my strongest allies, and you can all be very proud of that because Finland is listened to uh, in those discussions. And, you know, if, if I can end on, on something that I, I find extremely important, we are being challenged in a way that humanity has never been challenged before. There's all sorts of ways in, in which this could, could go south and wrong, uh, terribly wrong. But there's also many ways in which this could go well, and that's because we have a young generation that is motivated, that is not motivated by personal gain, much less than my generation, that is not motivated by materialism, much less than my generation, that is motivated by creating a better planet. And I want to thank you for that. With you, we will succeed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. I know you have a very busy timetable. I saw your schedule, so I'm very honored that you had the time to be with us here today. Thank you.